a lot. Muhammad al Muhammad Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا سين القرآن الحكيم إنك لمن المرسلين على سبرات مستقيم تنزيل العزيز الرحيم لتنذر قوما ما أنذر آباء لقد حق القول على وسباء عليهم أنذرتهم أم لم تنذرهم لا يؤمنون إنما تنذر من اتبع الذكر وخشي الرحمن بالغيب فبشره بمغفرة وأجر كريم إنا نحن نحيي الموتى ونكتب ما قدموا وآثارهم وكل شيء أحصيناه في إمام مبين واضرب لهم مثلا أصحاب القرية إذ جاءها المرسلون إذا أرسلنا إليهم اثنين فكذبوهما فعززنا بخالف فقالوا إنا فقالوا إنا إليكم مرسلون قالوا ما أنتم إلا بشر مثلنا وما أنزل الرحمن من شيء إن أنتم إلا تكذبون قالوا ربنا يعلم إنا إليكم لمرسلون وما علينا إلا البلاغ المبين قالوا إنا تطيرنا بكم لئن لم تنتهون لنرجمنكم وليمسنكم منا عذاب أليم قالوا طائركم معكم أن أن ذكرتم بل أنتم قوم مسرفون وجاء من أقصى المدينة رجل يسعى قال يا قوم اتبعوا المرسلين قال يا قوم اتبعوا المرسلين اتبعوا من الله يسألكم أجرهم وهم محتدون وما لي لا أعبد الذي فطرني وإليه ترجعون أتخذ من دونه آلهة إن يردن الرحمن بضر الله تغني عني شفاعتهم شيئا ولا ينقذون إني إذا لفي ضلال مبين إني آمنت بربكم فاسمعون قيل انخل الجنة قال يا ليت قومي يعلمون بما غفر لربي وجعلني من المكرمين وما أنزلنا على قومه من بعده من جند من السماء وما كنا منزلين إن كانت إلا صفيحة واحدة فإذا هم خامدون يا حسرة على العباد ما يعطيهم من رسول إلا كانوا به يستهزئون ألم يروا كم أحلكنا قبلهم من القرون أنهم إليهم لا يرجعون وإن كل لما جميع لدينا محضرون وآيات لهم الأرض الميتة أحييناها وأخذناها 
أخرجنا منها حبا فمنه يأكلون وجعلنا فيها جنات من خيل وعناب وفجرنا فيها من العيون ويأكل من فمره وما عملت أيديهم أفلا يشكرون سبحان الذي خلق الأزواج كلها مما تنبت الأرض ومن أنفسهم ومما لا يعلمون وآية لهم الليل نسخ من النهار فإذا هم مظلمون والشمس تجري لمستقر لها ذلك تقدير العزيز العليم والقمر قدرناه منازل حتى عاد كالعرجون القديم لا الشمس ينبغي لها أن تدرك القمر ولا الليل سابق النهار فكل في فلك يسبحون وآيات لهم أنا حملنا بريتهم في الفلك المشحون وخلقنا لهم مثله ما يركبون وإن نشاء نغركم فلا سريخ لهم ولا هم ينقذون إلا رحمة منا ومطاعا إلى حين وإذا قيل لهم اتقوا ما بين عيديكم وما خلفكم لعلكم ترحمون وما تعطيهم من آيات من آيات ربهم إلا كانوا عنها معرضين وإذا قيل لهم أنفقوا مما رزقكم الله قال الذين كفروا للذين كفروا للذين آمنوا أنطعم من لو يشاء الله أطعمه إن أنتم إلا في ضلال مبين ويقولون متى هذا الوعد إن كنتم صادقين ما ينظرون إلا صفحة واحدة تأخذهم وهم يخصمون فلا يستطيعون توصية ولا إلى أحلهم يرجعون ونفخ في السور فإذا هم من الأجداف إلى ربهم ينسلون قالوا يا ويلنا من بعفنا من مرقدنا هذا ما وعد الرحمن وصدق المرسلون إن كانت إلا أصبحة واحدة فإذا هم جميع لدينا محضرون فاليوم لا تظلم نفس شيئا ولا تجزون إلا ما كنتم تعملون إن أصحاب الجنة اليوم في شغل فاكهون هم وأزواجهم في زلال على الأرائك متكئون لهم فيها فاكهة ولهم ما يدعون سلام قولا من رب الرحيم وامتاز اليوم أيها المجرمون ألم أهد إليكم يا بني آدم ألا تعبدوا الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين ونعبدوني هذا صراط مستقيم ولقد أبل منكم جبلا كثيرا أفلم تكونوا تعقلون آبه جهنم التي كنتم توعدون اسلوها اليوم بما كنتم تكفرون اليوم نختم على أفواههم وتكلمنا أيديهم وتشهد أرجلهم وتشهد أرجلهم بما كانوا يكسبون 
ولو نشاء لتمسنا على أعينهم فاستبقوا الصراط فعنا يبصرون ولو نشاء لمسخناهم على مكانتهم فما استطاعوا مضيا ولا يرجعون ومن نعمره ننكسه في الخلق أفلا يأقلون وما علمناه الشعر وما ينبغي له إن هو إلا ذكر وقرآن مبين لينذر من كان حيا ويحك القول على الكافرين أولم يروا أن خلقنا لهم مما عملت أيدينا أنعاما فهم لها مالكون فذللناها لهم فمنها ركوبهم ومنها يأكلون ولهم فيها منافع ومشارب أفلا يشكرون واتخذوا من دون الله آلهة لعلهم ينصرون لا يستطيعون نصرهم وهم لهم جند محضرون فلا يحزنك قولهم إنا نعلم ما يسرون وما يعلنون أولم يرى الإنسان أن خلقناه من نطفة فإذا هو خسيم مبين وضرب لنا مثلا ونسي خلقه قال من يحيي العظام وهي رميم قل يحييها الذي أنشأها أول مرة وهو بكل خلق عليم الذي جعل لكم من الشجر الأخضر نارا فإذا أنتم منه تؤقدون أوليس الذي خلق السماوات والأرض بقادر على أن يخلق مثلهم ولا هو الخلاق العليم إنما أمره إذا أراد شيئا أن يقول له فرق فيكون فسبحان الذي بيده ملكوت كل شيء وإليه ترجعون صدق الله العلي العظيم الله صل على محمد وعلى محمد السلام الله
से बरी के तारे मारे गए यहीं पे बेद दियोस तम से
अपने घर जिन्होंने मस्त किया है वाकई तरफ 
آپ کی توجہ ملبوس کرانا چاہتا ہوں اور میں طالب علم ہوں آپ بزرگ بہتر جانتے ہیں کہ فطرس نے مولا حسین کے جھولے سے اپنے پر کو مس کیا تھا مولا کے جسم سے ٹچ نہیں کیا تھا تو ہم بھی جب زیارت میں ہم حسین علیہ السلام کرتے ہیں کربلا جاتے ہیں تو آپ کی ذریعے سے ہم مس ہوتے ہیں اسی حوالے سے میں شیر پیش کر رہا ہوں دیکھئے گا ہو گیا ہوتنے حسین سے مس Thank you. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبكم إن شاء الله والحديث الكساء فرض بعد المجلس إن شاء الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد عن فاطمة الزهراء عليها السلام بنت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم أنها قالت دخل علي أبي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم في بعض الأيام فقال السلام عليك يا فاطمة فقلت عليك السلام يا أبتا فقال لي يا فاطمة إني أجد في بدني ضعفا فقلت له أعيذك بالله يا أبتا من الضعف فقال لي يا فاطمة ائتيني بالكساء اليماني فغطيني به فأتيته بالكساء اليماني فغطيته به وصرت أنظر إليه وإذا وجهه يتلألأ كأنه البدر في ليلتي تمامي وكماله وإذا بولد الحسن عليه السلام قد أقبل وقال السلام عليك يا أمة فقلت عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا قرة عيني وثمرة فؤادي فقال لي يا أمة إني أشم عندك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة جدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم فقلت نعم إن جدك تحت الكساء فدنا الحسن عليه السلام نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جداه يا رسول الله أتأذن لي أن أكون معك تحت الكساء فقال صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وعليك السلام يا ولدي ويا صاحب حوضي قد أذنت لك فدخل الحسن عليه السلام معه تحت الكساء فما كانت إلا ساعة وإذا بولد الحسين عليه السلام قد أقبل وقال السلام عليك يا أمة قلت عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا قرة عيني وثمرة فؤادي فقال لي يا أمة إني أشم عندك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة جدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم فقلت نعم إن جدك وأخاك تحت الكساء فأقبل الحسين عليه السلام نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جدا السلام عليك يا من اختاره الله أتأذن لي أن أدخل معكما تحت الكساء فقال صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وعليك السلام يا ولدي ويا شافع أمتي قد أذنت لك فدخل الحسين عليه السلام معهما تحت الكساء وعند ذلك أقبل أبو الحسن علي بن أبي طالب صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وقال السلام عليك يا بنت رسول الله فقلت عليك السلام يا أبا الحسن ويا أمير المؤمنين فقال لي يا فاطمة إني أشم عندك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة أخي وابن عمي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم فقلت نعم ها هو مع ولديك تحت الكساء فأقبل علي عليه السلام نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله أتأذن لي أن أكون معكم تحت الكساء 
فقال صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وعليك السلام يا أخي ووصي وصاحب نوائي قد أذنت لك فدخل علي عليه السلام معهم تحت الكساء فعند ذلك دنوت نحو الكساء وقلت السلام عليك يا بتاه يا رسول الله أتأذن لي أن أدخل معكم تحت الكساء فقال صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وعليك السلام يا بنتي ويا بضعتي قد أذنت لك فدخلت معهم تحت الكساء فلما اكتملنا جميعا تحت الكساء أخذ أبي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم بطرفي الكساء وأومأ بيده اليمنى إلى السماء وقال اللهم إن هؤلاء أهل بيتي وخاصتي وحامتي لحمهم لحمي ودمهم دمي يؤلمني ما يؤلمهم ويحزنني ما يحزنهم أنا حرب لمن حاربهم ومحب لمن أحبهم وعدو لمن عاداهم وسلم لمن سالمهم إنهم مني وأنا منهم فاجعل صلواتك وبركاتك ورحمتك وغفرانك ورضوانك علي وعليهم وأذهب عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا ويا سكان سماوات إني ما خلقت سماء مبنية ولا أرضا مدحية ولا قمرا منيرا ولا شمسا مضيئا ولا فلكا يدور ولا بحرا يجري ولا فلكا يسري إلا في محبة هؤلاء الخمسة الذين هم تحت الكساء فقال الأمين جبرائيل عليه السلام يا رب ومن تحت الكساء فقال عز وجل هم أهل بيت النبوة ومعدن الرسالة هم فاطمة وأبوها وبعلها لأكون معهم سادسا فقال عز وجل نعم قد أذنت لك فهبط الأمين جبرائيل عليه السلام وقال لأبي السلام عليك يا رسول الله العلي الأعلى يقرئك السلام ويخصك بالتحية والإكرام ويقول لك وعزتي وجلالي إني ما خلقت سماء مبنية ولا أرضا مدحية ولا قمرا منيرا ولا شمسا مضيئة ولا بحرا يجري ولا فلك يسري ولا فلك يدور إلا لأجلكم ومحبتكم وقد أذن لي يا رسول الله أن أهبط إلى الأرض لأكون معكم سادسا فهل تأذن لي يا رسول الله فقال صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وعليك السلام يا أمين وحي الله إنه نعم قد أذنت لك فدخل الأمين جبرائيل عليه السلام معنا تحت الكساء فعند ذلك قال لأبي إن الله قد أوحى إليكم يقول إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا فعند ذلك قال علي عليه السلام لأبي يا رسول الله أخبرني 
ما لجنوسنا هذا تحت الكساء من الفضل عند الله فقال صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم والذي بعثني بالحق نبيا واصطفاني برسالة نجيا ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في محفل من محافل أهل الأرض وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا إلا ونزلت عليهم الرحمن وحفت بهم الملائكة واستغفرت لهم إلى أن يتفرقوا فقال علي عليه السلام إذا والله فزنا وفاز شيعتنا ورب الكعبة فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم يا علي والذي بعثني بالحق نبيا واصطفاني بالرسالة نجيا ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في محفل من محافل أهل الأرض وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا وفيهم مهموم إلا وفرج الله همه ولا مغموم إلا وكشف الله غمه ولا طالب حاجة إلا وقضى الله حاجة فقال علي عليه السلام إذا والله فزنا وسعدنا وكذلك شيعتنا فازوا وسعدوا في الدنيا والآخرة ورب الكعبة especially the Muslims whom we mentioned their names earlier. Rahimallah, man yaqra'a surat al-mubarakat al-fatiha ma'a salat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. سيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المحصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الإجساء وطهرهم تطهيرا السلام عليك يا با عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا غريب كربلاء رزقنا الله في الدنيا زيارتكم وفي الآخرة شفاعتكم أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين إن مكناهم في الأرض أقاموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة وأمروا بالمعروف ونهوا عن المنكر ولله عاقبة الأمور صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa 
As he was about to leave Medina, he wrote a letter to his brother Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya used to get seizures, so that's why he was unable to join the Imam. And he stayed back in Medina. Plus, the Imam عليه, did not want to take all of Bani Hashim with him so that not all of them get killed. So, Abdullah, the son of Ja'far al-Tayyar, also stayed back in Medina. However, Abdullah's sons, Aun and Muhammad, they joined the Imam <coughs> So the Imam عليه, wrote a letter to his brother Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyyah in which he said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is the letter of al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib to his brother Muhammad ibn al Hanafiyyah. Amma ba'd, Amma wallah, inni ma kharajtu, la ashiran, wala batiran, wala waliman, wala mufsida. إنما خرجت لطلب الإصلاح في أمة جدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم اللهم صل على محمد وآل وآمر بالمعروف وأنهى عن المنكر فمن اتبعني فقد اتبع الحق والله أولى باتباع الحق ومن رغب عني فأصبر حتى يحكم الله بالحق وهو أحكم الحاكمين he said, by Allah, I did not rise. Ashiran, which means seeking materialistic gain. Yani I am not seeking power. Nor am I rising out of vanity. I have nothing better in my life to do, so let me just go in a revolution. No. ولا ظالما نور ما ينوبرسر ولا مفسدا نور ما يسيتين كوربشن. So what is the purpose of my rise then? إنما خرجت I am rising solely only for the purpose of الإصلاح في أمة جدي رسول الله. I am seeking the restoration of the nation of my grandfather. And to do Amr bil Ma'ruf and Nahi Anil Munkar. To command good, forbid evil. So whomever follows me, then he has followed the truth, Al Haq. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more worthy of being followed with the haqq. And whomever leaves me, then I shall be patient until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges his decree. And he stamped his letter and he gave it to his brother. This letter became a very important document from Medina before leaving the city of Medina, the Imam Salamullah Alayh declared his revolution and declared the purposes or the purpose of his revolution so that nobody can come later on, like many historians who try to distort history or writers who try to falsify the truth and say that, you know, the Imam or al Hussein alayhi salam did not really clearly state why he was rising. Some people started saying that he was seeking power. Some people started saying other things. Some people started saying that he rose unjustly, unfairly against the Khalifa. Once the Khalifa is there, you cannot rise against him. They started to fabricate some ahadith from the Prophet ﷺ that whomever comes as a Khalifa, you have to obey him, whether he is just or unjust. 
whether it is fair or unfair. So they started fabricating all these hadith, and hence people started to accuse Billah, al Imam al Hussein alayhi salam of causing corruption, of being unfair in his rise, of seeking materialistic gain, and so on and so forth. Imam Salamullah alayhi wanted to shut all these doors from the start. And so this document becomes a very important document and clearly stating his motives behind his rise. And throughout his journey when he was in Mecca, he clearly also indicated to people that I am going to Iraq, we're moving, not to seek any power. In fact, we will be killed. He clearly stated in his khutbah in Mecca, he gave a khutbah in Mecca, he said khutbah al-mawtu ala ibn Adam, makhatta al-qiladati ala jid al-fatat, wa ka'anni bi-awsali. He says, death has been prescribed upon people, just like sometimes the necklace engraves on the neck of the woman. <coughs> it's been engraved on us. <coughs> And it is as if I see my limbs being cut into pieces in the land of Taf, which occurs between those two areas, Karbala and Nawawis. You know, that's exactly the exact location of where he will be killed. So he said, I am seeing this. We are going to die. So he made his... Intentions clear, and this is out of his greatness, Salamullah alayhi. So nobody says, you fooled me. You did not tell me the truth. From the beginning, it was clear. If the Imam, Salamullah alayhi, were seeking power, then why would he tell the people I'm going to die? He would just tell them, come and support me, and in fact, he would have garnered a lot more support. People had not known he was going to die. Many more people would have may have come to support him, Salamullah alayhi. But he wanted to make it clear to people from the beginning. So a person who is seeking power, why would he say that from the beginning? He would try to gain as much power as he can get to fight his enemies. That's a clear indication he was not seeking any power. Nor is he seeking any corruption. <coughs> Nor is he being a tyrant, as he himself states. So one of the important purposes of his rise is restoration, islah. That's something important that we need to learn as a community. That we need to do islah. We need to always restore the true aqaid the true ahkam and the akhlaq amongst the followers of Ahlul Bayti alayhim And then expand that and educate those who do not follow the school of Ahlul Bayti alayhim by holding conferences to talk about an Imam al Hussein alayhim salam, by holding seminars to discuss the government of Amir al Mu'mineen alayhim salam by holding, for example, workshops where we can educate people about the sciences of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam. All these things which we, unfortunately, as Shia, we have not been doing really well. As followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam really we have not really done a good job Yes, you might have individual efforts here and there, but generally speaking, as a Shia community, for example, if you take a look at the city of London, where you have thousands of Shia, in fact, tens of thousands of Shia, walhamdulillah, how many conferences are held every year where we invite non-Muslims to attend and we discuss about the thoughts, the theology, the ideologies of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as How many? How many times have we introduced the mentality of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as to foreigners? 
How often do people know the difference between Shia and other madhah? In the past year or two years, how many of such seminars have been conducted? That puts it as fault. We have not done a good job. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, Introduce people to us, for by Allah, if the people come to recognize who we are, they will follow us. Nonetheless, at least within our own circle of the followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, we need to do Islam. <coughs> by educating the people, the followers of Ahlul Bayt السلام, about our haqa'id. What are our haqa'id? What do we believe in? The stronger the haqa'id are, means the stronger the foundation. Like we say, it is usul al-deen, the root of the religion, the root. Recently, there, was, there were some hurricanes in, in the United States, RV, Irma, now they have Maria. Yeah. <clears throat> and you take a look at some pictures, you know, videos. SubhanAllah, you see how the hurricane comes. You see roofs flying, houses flying. But then you see, SubhanAllah, some palm trees. Palm trees, they're standing there still. They don't move. Yes, they're shaking. The leaves are shaking. But the tree itself, you hardly ever see a palm tree flying. You wonder, SubhanAllah, Look at the structure, the building of human versus the building of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. With all this engineering that we have, all this technology that we have, we still are unable to establish buildings that cannot, you know, move when they are faced with hurricanes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has these palm trees which don't move because their roots are just so strong. And that's what our usul al deen should be. We have a problem now is that our usul have become weak. You ask people, why is it important? Or in fact, can you prove that there is Allah? They start questioning you, you know, is there God, is there no God? You know, they start asking all these questions. Especially because people sometimes go to universities, they're exposed to some philosophies, to some ideologies, to some ideas that people start questioning what's going on here. Then people start questioning about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. The concept of Ma'ad, is there going to be life after death? Do we have another place where we have to be held responsible for our actions? People start doubting these things. And even those who believe in them, even those who believe in them, if people really come to the understanding that we have Ma'ad, we have Hisab, we have a day of judgment, where Allah will hold us accountable for every action that we have done. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَهُ No matter what a small or bad deed you've done, good or bad, you will see it, will see it. Our actions are going to be transformed such that they become physical. A word that I may have said, which is a good word of maw'adha, admonishment, that may guide somebody, that word may transfer into a beautiful tree with a beautiful aroma. Another word, billah, of ghibah, of backbiting, of insult to a mu'min or a mu'mina, that word will, can transfer to a snake, billah or a scorpion that comes and bites us in our qabr and our graves. That same word, things will start to transfer. That world is a different world, different life from what we have here. If people are aware of this, then they would never disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have so many of our sisters who do not wear hijab. And in fact, they don't even like us to talk about wearing hijab. If they were to come to the understanding that they will be held accountable for their actions. In the Qabr, what will they answer Allah? We have in the riwayat, Munkar and nakir Even in Dua Abu Hamza Thumali, 
by Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam he says I cry this beautiful dua Abu Hamza al-Thumali which is recommended to be recited in the holy month of Ramadan and the, the Imam says I cry and why shall I not cry I cry for the time when my soul leaves my body I cry this is the Imam saying I'm crying I cry for the time I am put in my grave I cry for the darkness of the grave. I cry for the questioning of Munkar and Nakim in my grave. I cry for my resurrection on the day of judgment all alone, bearing the weight of my deeds on my back, looking one to my left, looking to my right, seeing everyone is running after their own affairs. On that day, there will be some faces that will be bright and shining and others that will be dark and gloomy. So these are the words of the Imam Salaam Allah This is what he's saying. If the Imam says, I cry, then what about you and I? We should be weeping, not just crying. If our sisters were to know this, we'd find all of them are in hijab. <laughs> If our brothers were to know the consequences of their actions, not a single person becomes arrogant with Riyadh of Islam. I have this degree. I have this much wealth. I have to do things my way. Yes, sooner or later, they will say this mayit. That's it. People will come and say, who is the mayit? They said the mayit is Fulan. They won't say Dr. Fulan anymore. Khalas. You're done, my brother. That's it. The Salat al Mayyit. That's it. Finish. He's become a Mayyit now. That's it. But your good deeds will remain. Your good deeds, your A'mal will remain. Oh, well, Ayyad Billah, your bad deeds. They'll remain. If we have that kind of Aqeedah, that kind of faith, then a person will never disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Imam, sallamullahi alayhi, one thing he wanted to do is to restore the Aqeedah of the Muslims. Restore their aqaid. That's why if you look at his khutbas, his sermons on the day of Ashura, look at the aqaid in there. First of all, he reminds people of the akhir. He tells these people that don't be fooled by this dunya and its temporal life. Remember the akhir. <laughs> and then he reminds them of Nabuwa and Imama that look at me. Is there any son of the Prophet's daughter? alive on the face of earth today other than me so why do you come to fight you people believe in Allah and you believe in Rasulullah and you've come to fight against me what kind of faith is this what kind of Iman is this he takes the Holy Quran and he puts it on his head and he tells the people don't you know that Rasulullah is my grandfather. Ali, Amir al Mu'mineen, my father. Fatima is my mother. Hamza is the uncle of my father. Ja'far, who's flying in the paradise with wings, is my uncle. So he starts to remind people of the Aqa'il to strengthen their Aqeedah. Aqa'il is very important. What else? So restore the people's aqa'id, restore the people's faith, restore the people's belief, and do amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi anil munkar. Amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi anil munkar is extremely important. One of the ulama was asked, why is it important that we have to educate people about what's right and what's wrong? From a religious perspective. His response was, if you see a blind man, walking and in front of him there is a big hole and he is going to go and fall into that hole what would you do as an individual would you leave him falling into that hole or would you go <coughs> and try to avert him save him these days I think we will all take out our mobile phones and just film him as he falls into the hole <laughs> He says that's what people do these days, unfortunately. 
you're laughing, but there was a case in the United States where a bunch of youth were charged because someone was drowning and instead of going to save him, they were filming him. Literally, that's what happened. So they were charged for doing this. So these days, unfortunately, we'll just watch that film and then laugh, post it on YouTube and then laugh about it. But for people who have some sanity left in them, some common sense left in them, for those people, what would they try to do? Try to save this man from falling into the hole. This alim then said, if you are saving a blind man from falling into the hole so that he does not hurt himself, then wouldn't it be more important to save people from falling into the pit of the hellfire, والعياذ billah where it's eternity. So it's important to educate people. But who is able to do Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar? Fuqaha give some criteria. One, they say the person who does Amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar should know what is ma'roof and what is munkar. You have individuals, sometimes they don't have a clue what is ma'roof and what is munkar. And so they try to speculate, introduce some things which are not there in the Sharia. People have to know what is ma'ruf and what is munkar. <coughs> not everyone becomes a faqih then, making up his own style of the religion. So a person has to know what is ma'ruf and what is munkar. One of the ulama writes in a book, he says there was a julus, azar, somewhere in Iran, where people on the day of Ashura were kind of in a julus, in a azar, on the street. They were doing, you know, matab and so on and so forth. One of the people there observes that one of the youths, one of the younger people in the matab, in the azar, in the julus, he is looking at a girl. Some girl is standing on the street, he's looking at her. This man gets upset. He goes to this young man and slaps him on the face. Telling him that you are in the matam of Imam Hussein. how dare you look at other women? Now he did not ask him, Yaqi, is this maybe your sister, this is your wife, this is your Maybe it's his wife, maybe it's his sister. Did you ask him beforehand? Okay, do Amr bin Ma'roof, but not this way. <laughs> you don't have to slap yourself, my brother. <laughs> so sometimes you have people like this. It is said that this man who slapped the young man, he said, I went back home, I had a huge pain in my arm that day. I had a huge pain in my arm. And the pain did not go away, no matter how much I put lotions, medication, etc., etc. Until at night, I went and I apologized from this man. I apologized. He said, I forgive you, don't worry about it. He said, when he forgave me then, the pain went away. Sometimes we're like this. We do amr bin ma'roof and nahi anil munkar when we don't know what is ma'roof and what is munkar. We have to know what is ma'roof and what is munkar. Got to advise people about Salat. Salat is wajib. Some individuals say, no, it's okay if you're in the majlis of Imam Hussein, you love Imam Hussein, you don't have to worry about Salat. What nonsense is this? We read in the ziyara of Imam Hussein, Ashhadu annaka qad aqamtal Salat. The ayah I just recited, those whom if we enable them to rule on earth. Aqamu salat Establish salat Wa atahu al-zakat. Wa amaru bil ma'roof wa nahu an al-munkar. On the day of Ashura, Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam, within about an hour now he's going to leave this dunya and go to Jannah. And he knows he's going to Jannah. Within an hour or two, the time of Salat comes. What does he do? He could have said, you know what, Allah, I'm going to Jannah, inshallah. That's it, we're done. We've been praying for the past 57 years of my life. I've been doing Salat. Now, khalas, that's it. In, two, in one hour, two hours, I'm going to Allah. His companions, they were not masumi. 
They were people like us. One of them, some of them who were there still alive. One of them by the name of Abu Thumama al saini comes to the Imam and says, Yamna Rasulullah, Allah knows that there is nothing more beloved to me than dying in your way to defend you. However, I see the time of Salat has come. So I would like to meet my Lord having prayed the Salat. <clears throat> this companion is going to go to Jannah. He knows he's going to Jannah because the Imam told him, you're all going to Jannah. Well, I'm going to Jannah, خلاص, you know, why, why should I bother with Salat? That's it. But what got those people into Jannah is their Salat, is their Quran. That's why they became the companions of Imam al-Husayn So the Imam told him, you remembered Salat, may Allah make you among those who establish the Salat. And indeed, the Imam stops there to pray, and he keeps two mu'mineen in front of him to defend the arrows. So they're being showered with arrows and spears, and they stand for Salat. And then someone, you know, might come and think that it's okay, yeah, if you love Imam al Hussein, you go to Jannah. Yes, you might, inshallah, you go to Jannah, but you better do it salat. If Imam al Hussein prayed, he himself, the Imam himself, Imam Ali prayed, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to pray, then who are we not to pray? How are you going to go to Jannah without prayers? These are important things to learn. Khums is wajib. You have to pay khums. You have excess money, excess income. You paid your mortgage, you paid your car loans, you went with your family into a vacation. You bought your food, everything, and you still have a thousand pounds, for example, sitting in the account. Or a hundred pounds still sitting in the account. After the year end, you choose a year end date. Khalas, there's khums on that hundred pounds. Twenty percent have to pay. These are important ahkam. This is Amr bin Ma'ruf. But someone has to know what is Ma'ruf and what is Munkar. Second, they say Amr bin Ma'ruf and Nahi an al-Munkar is done to the person who insists on doing the Munkar. Or is not doing the Ma'ruf. Somebody who does not wear the hijab. You go and try to educate her. But hijab is wajib. Somebody where Ayala Billah listens to haram music. And many of our children these days listen to music. In fact, not only our children, even mashallah the adults these days. Especially at the time of wedding, mashallah. A wedding, khalas, you know, it's like as if it's okay. That day, everything is halal. Everything is halal on the day of wedding. Angels are not watching. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not watching. Nobody, khalas. You can do whatever you want on the day of wedding. Mix gatherings, music, dancing, whatever. Yeah, this is once in a lifetime. It's okay, you know, no problem. What once in a lifetime? Who says? I know it's once in a lifetime. Why do you start in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was preparing Fatima sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa to go to the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi After their nikah, a week later, she joined the house of Imam Ali alayhi wa He told the ladies, the ladies who are going to take her to the house of the Imam sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi to her new house, he told them, do not, you know, you can recite poetry, no problem. Recite poetry, enjoy yourselves. But don't say anything that is of Allah's disobedience. Don't do anything that is disobedience to Allah. Don't do ma'asiyah. Don't do sin. Don't say something that is haram. Otherwise, go enjoy yourselves. And indeed, that's what they did. So enjoy yourself in that day, but within the boundaries of the sharia. If somebody is constantly listening to haram music, watching haram things, Go oh, educate them. You do amul ma'ruf and Or if someone is about to do something which is haram, and you become aware of it, a lady says, for example, I'm going to take off my hijab or ayahu billah. Or a boy who says, you know, for example, I'm going to go to this place, which is haram place. Then you try to educate them. Don't. Don't. What if, what if, God forbid, you die in that place? What's going to happen? You're going to answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is this really the way you want to die? Leave this dunya? Like that? So maybe you, might, you might knock some senses into somebody. So if someone insists on the munkar, or someone who does not do the ma'roof, or someone is about to engage in something that is munkar, 
Then you remind them, admonish them. Third, you can admonish someone knowing that he or she, inshallah, will learn, will benefit from it. If someone is not going to benefit, <laughs> then you don't have to do Amr al-Ma'ruf and Nahi al-Munkar. However, you can show you are unhappy with what they're doing. Someone who says, for example, in the wedding, no, I'm going to have a mixed gathering, music, whatever you tell is haram, no, forget it. Mind your own business. Okay, no problem, I'll mind my own business. You're invited to my wedding, forget it. I'm not going to come to your nikah. You see, the problem sometimes, brothers and sisters, is we assist the people in doing the munkar. We help them. If someone is having such a wedding, for example, and no, no one shows up, if no one turns up, you think anyone else will have such a wedding later on? The problem is we, we go and we say, it's embarrassing, you know, this guy, mashallah, is a very wealthy man, you know, I have to go to his, you know, child's wedding, you know, it's, oh, he's my cousin, he's my brother, he's my sister, she's my sister, who cares? <coughs> the problem is we give consent, we associate with such people. So we allow the monkar to happen. Then you are equally guilty. You are equally guilty in the sin. Because you're consenting to it and you're supporting it. If a person, however, is not going to listen, you don't have to do Amr But you can show your discomfort. Another important aspect of the Amr al-Ma'ruf is that it may not, it, if it's going to harm the individual, it's going to cause death to the individual, for example. You know, in some parts of the world today where the Shias are being targeted, they're being attacked. If you go to one of those people who are the attackers, for example, and you try to tell them, Ya Akhi, this is haram, don't do this, you know, don't kill the Shia, don't kill the Mu'mineen, he might kill you. <laughs> So in that case, you do not have to do Amul Ma'ruf and Ayyad al-Munkar. You can, you can, but you don't have to. You don't have to. So a person who does Amul Ma'ruf and Ayyad al-Munkar should know what is Ma'ruf, what is Munkar. He should do Amul Ma'ruf and Ayyad al-Munkar to somebody who is insisting on doing the Munkar or not doing the Ma'ruf. Or someone who's about to engage in some action that may not be of Allah's obedience. Third, if a person suspects that the person will not listen, will not really give an ear to, to a Muslim Ma'ruf, you don't have to give. But you can still show your discomfort. <coughs> and fourth, if it's going to cause harm to the individual, then you don't have to do a Muslim Ma'ruf. However, doing the a Muslim Ma'ruf is important. It's everyone's duty. We should all learn what is Ma'ruf, what is Munkar. And we all engage together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, in Surah Ali Imran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Let there be a ummah, a group amongst you. وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إ those are the successful ones. You want to be successful? This is what you need to do. But to do Amr al-Ma'ruf al-Munkar, you should also try yourself out. To the best of your ability. I get called sometimes by some mu'mineen. They call me, they say, Shaykh, there is this zakir or this zakira, for example, who does tabligh and whatever. However, this zakir does not wear hijab. Should we attend her lectures? Or this zakir himself does not pray. Should we attend his? But he's got a really good voice, mashallah. He recites really nicely. Should we attend? I tell them it's up to you if you want to attend or not to attend. I'm not going to say no. But if a person who himself is not really practicing what he's preaching, then how much effect is he going to have on people? And this is not just a show, entertainment. You know, we're not going there just to have fun. Whereas if a person really practices what he preaches, that will have an impact on, what the, pe on the people. People can feel. I attended once a lecture of an individual. This individual, he was not even a Muhammad, he was not a Sheikh. He was giving a lecture about istighfar. 
His content was good. The content of his discussion was good. However, subhanAllah, ulama say, you know, when they teach you ulama of akhlaq, they teach in the house, they say what comes from the heart goes into the people's heart. If you really want to talk to people, speak to them from the heart. This person, when he spoke, it did not penetrate the heart. He gave a good talk. Content-wise was good, but it had no effect. I attended a majlis once of a alim, one of the ulama, may Allah bless him, still alive. A alim is talking about istighfar. During the majlis, while he's talking, he's not leading musibah. He's talking about istighfar. You find everyone in tears. He's crying and people are crying. When he's talking about istighfar, seeking tawbah from Allah, turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is crying and people are crying. He's not even making musibah. Because he's speaking from his heart. And people are get touched. They're touched. So you find them crying in the middle of the majlis. Obviously this alim will have a much greater impact on these people. Because he practices what he preaches. That's important. That's why it is said in the ahadith, Mujalasatul ulama'i ibadah. To sit with the alim is ibadah. Even sitting with them. Because the way they talk, the alim, the ulama, we unfortunately did not get the opportunity to see our imams, alayhim as -salam. We did not get that opportunity, unfortunately. However, we have the next best thing, which is our ulama. That's the next best thing we have. When you take a look at our ulama, these people who have studied in the house, especially our maraja' al taqleed may Allah bless them, inshaAllah, these mujtahideen, these people who really suffered, suffered, they've gone through hunger. If you read the stories of some of these ulama, days they go without food, some of them. They live in poverty, they live in difficulty, until they achieve these degrees. Degrees, of course, not, you know, university degrees, these statuses. These rents. These ulama, when you look at them, subhanAllah, noor is coming out of their faces. You sit down with them, you see the way they're talking. Their akhlaq, how they behave. People gain from them. And that's why also in Dua Abu Hamza at Tumali, Dua Abu Hamza, Imam Salamullah Alayhi has an interesting statement. He says, وَلَعَلَّكَ فَقَدْتَنِي مِن مَجَالِسِ الْعُلَمَاءِ فَخَذَلْتَنِي there are concepts called Tawfiq and Khidlan. You know Tawfiq in Urdu, I think you use the same word, Tawfiq. Right? You have this word, Tawfiq in Urdu. Tawfiq. Somebody who has Tawfiq. Someone who builds, for example, 10 Imam Barbas. He has Tawfiq. This is Tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Somebody who builds a hospital for the orphans. That's Tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone to attend the majalis of Ahlul Bayt alayhi muslim. That's Tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's Tawfiq. Opposite of Tawfiq in Arabic is something called Khidlan. Khudlan is the opposite of Tawfiq. You want to come to the majlis, you get a flat tire. You miss the opportunity of coming to the majlis. You miss that Tawfiq. You try, Allah, Allah will give you the edge of it. Because you made your knee. Allah will give you that. You try to do something, you don't get it. You plan to go to Hajj, you get your visa, something happens last minute. And you don't end up going to Hajj. I know someone this year, this year. He got his visa, everything is done. The courier company who's sending his passport loses his passport. This year, subhanAllah. His tickets are booked, his pay, everything is done. He should receive his passport and in two days he leaves for Hajj. The courier company loses the passport. Follow, so it's gone. That's it. And he misses Hajj. That's it. Lack of tawfiq. SubhanAllah. That's called Khidlan. Khidlan. Imam Salamullah Ali and Dua Abu Hamza says one of the reasons for khidlan, for lacking the tawfiq, is because, Ya Allah, maybe you did not see me sitting among the ulama. So you made me become unsuccessful, lacking the tawfiq, khidlan. This is important aspect. That's what the Imam Salamullah Ali rose to do to educate people, to learn about the ahkam. One mu'min came to me one day, he said, Shaykh, I am going to Hajj. This mu'min maybe at the time was in his mid-40s, approximately. 
He said, can you please see the way I do wudu? I looked at the way he does wudu and it was not right. So this man was in his mid-40s. Now then I showed, I told him, I'll, I'll show you how to do wudu. So I did wudu in front of him, I demonstrated. But I thought to myself, this man is in his mid-40s. So he's been, I mean, wajib to pray on him at least for the past 30 years. At least, they were taken. So what's been going on for the past 30 years? His wudu may have been in jeopardy. If it's his fault, it means he has to repeat the salat of 30 years. People come to the majalis, good. But you need to learn ahkam. Ahkam are important. How to do wudu properly. How to do ghusl properly. One person one time sends me an email. Sends me a message. He says, Sheikh, I am 21 years old. 21 years old. I just got married and I just found out about that ghusl which is a wajib ghusl that we have to perform. At the age of 21. And to make it even worse, he says, I've been to Umrah. I told him, go see the Magjar now. You go to that, talk to your Magjar, that leave now. This is like a, you have a, a huge problem here. What was his father doing with all due respect? I mean, I didn't say this to him. But what, what are the role of the parents? What are the parents doing? They should be teaching their children these things. Wajib ghusl, you know, for the girls, for example, what at the specific age becomes wajib, ahka. For the boys, there are some wajib things to do. Parents need to teach. Or at least the parents need to ensure that the children get taught. Whether taking them to a teacher to teach them, whether they teach them themselves, etc. That's... That's the responsibility of the parents. But we leave our children. When it comes to education, yes. We make sure that they're in the best universities, going to the best schools, getting the best degrees. But what about their salat and siyam and their ahkam? So these are important things to learn. Ahkam are important. How to do wudu properly, how to do ghusl properly, how to pray properly. How to dress properly. All these are important. That's basically what the Imam Sallallahu Alaihi rose for. To restore an islah. To do islah. Because the Ummah became deviant. The Ummah deviated from the Salat. From the straight path. I was just telling Mu'mineen that the time of the Imam Sallallahu Alaihi was similar to our time today. Where the Haqq became Batil and the Batil became Haqq. Things were flipped. Just like our world today. Today, if somebody is a religious, is a mu'min, they say, what, you are mullah? You become a mullah? I mean, what's wrong with mullahs, by the way? You know, look at us, alhamdulillah. What's wrong with us? Alhamdulillah. I think we're good people. We use smartphones. Alhamdulillah. So, well, if, if it's a mullah is a good thing, well, the mullahs are the ones who learn from the maraja, the maraja al taqlid Maraja al taqlid learn from the imams, alayhim wassalam, reading their history, reading from the akka. So yes, maybe everybody should live like a mullah. So today, the person who practices religion is a mu'min, muttaqi, he gets criticized. And that's why we have the term modern, you know. This guy is not modern. You know, this concept of modernity is an imperial concept. It came as an imperialistic one, concept. When the imperial powers came to our to the countries, to Muslim countries, they started building universities. You know, some of you may be aware. Universities in some countries, in some Muslim countries, were established by the imperial powers. I'm not sure about Pakistan itself, but I know in Iraq, for example. I'm not sure when was the first university built in Pakistan. Like proper university, like the ones we have these days. But in Iraq, these first universities were built at the time when <coughs> the imperial power started coming. So they started building these universities. The people who started attending these universities, they were called the modern people. They were the educated class. That's why you find, maybe in Pakistan it was the same thing. People who attended universities at those, in those days, in those days, we're talking about 60, 80 years ago, People who attended universities, they were called the educated class, and that educated class were usually non-religious. True. True. 
So you'd find that uh, wives don't wear hijab. The way they dress, the way they act, because we are the modern people, we're the educated people. Those people, the mullahs, they're the ones who are the masajid, you know, these guys, the mullahs. These are the mullahs. The uneducated. So those people, the doctors, the engineers, these are the modern ones. They're modern. Mullahs, they're not modern. They're old school. And so that concept became engraved into the minds of some people. Until today I hear some people saying, uh, this, these people are, are modern. I told them, don't say these words, modern. We're not backwards. I don't live in caves. <laughs> we also drive nice cars, alhamdulillah. We live in big houses, alhamdulillah. We, have, we carry smartphones, alhamdulillah. You know, we're educated people. We've been through universities. So it's not, there's nothing modern about them. Say they are not religious. Those people are not religious. They're not modern. In fact, they're backwards. They're the ones who are backwards. We are the modern ones. Because we believe in the religion of Allah. We follow the religion of Allah. That's important to realize. These are the ahkam of Allah. We need to follow them, implement them in our lives. This is what the Imam stood for. Our Imams, alayhi salam, struggled in their lives so that this religion reaches us. That's what we need to really remember. What would the Imam love to see of us? That's where the aqa'id come important. How would the Imam who is living amongst us love to see us in what way, in what state? Fighting amongst each other? Insulting one another? Backbiting? Being full of arrogance? Listening to music? Enjoying parties? Not wearing hijab? Is that really what the Imam wants of us? Or he wants to see a group of mu'mineen who are God-fearing? Yes, attending majalis are very important. But let's learn from the akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam When we leave this majlis, implement the akhlaq in our lives. Muharram this time is a time for us to reflect. How can I change myself to be a better mu'min? We say to the imam in our ziyarah, I wish I was with you, or the companions. Ya laytana kunna ma'akum. I wish I was with you so I can win. So if the imam comes, you think we're going to join him? If I am not wearing hijab, I listen to music, I don't pay my khums, I live my life any way I want. Yes, I pray, I fast, but everything else, you think I'm going to join the imam? When it comes a matter of life and death, if I have not been able to face my own desires when it comes to stopping listening to haram music, if I fail, against my desire of sleep for waking up for Fajr prayers. I fail in looking at the haram. I fail at doing all these haram things. I fail. You think when it comes to the time of Imam, I'm going to succeed? This is like, so I have someone who's running a marathon, 10 miles. Someone who has absolutely no background in running. First day, you put him there, say, run 10 miles. What's going to happen? The first mile, if he makes a mile, he'll drop. Khalas, that's it. But someone who's trained, first day he ran only half a mile. That's only how much he was able to run. Next day he ran one mile, and so on, so forth. After a month, two months, six months, now he prepared himself. Now he's ready for the ten miles. Preparation. What is our preparation? Praying Salat on time. Reading the du'as of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Attending the majalis of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Read in Quran, Imam Rabba alayhi salam says read at least 50, 5, 0 verses every single day. It's not wajib, it's mustahab. 50 verses of Quran every day. Praying Salatul Layl, reading the night prayer. These are amongst the things we can do to prepare ourselves. Reading Ziyarat Ashura on a daily basis. Reading Dua Ul Ahad. For our Imam alayhi salam, the 12th Imam, reading that on a daily basis. These are things we can do. How many of us do these things on a daily basis? Most of us wake up for Fajr, we pray, if we wake up, that is. We pray and then we put back our head and sleep. And he read a little bit of Quran, read Dua al ahad read Dua al sabah 15, 20 minutes, just read something and then go back to sleep if you wish. So these are important things. That's how we can train ourselves. So that we can, inshallah, join the Imam. That's what the Imam fought for. 
would find him sacrificing everything he has, the best of Allah's creation. As we just heard in Hadith al kisa Allah says, I did not create this whole universe but for the love of these people. When the best of Allah's creation, one of the best of Allah's creation, sacrifices himself for the sake of religion, Islam. So then, can you imagine how great Islam is? That the Imam, Salam Allah, sacrifices his life for the sake of Islam, the religion of Islam. So it's not to be taken lightly. But only himself, no. He also sacrifices companions, his family members, his children, even a six months old baby. It is difficult. Difficult. May Allah not make a person experience a loss of a child. But the loss of a child is very difficult. Especially when this child is like Ali al Akbar. <laughs> young man in his mid-twenties, <laughs> this early age, when many parents would hope that this child even grows older, grows bigger, you'd like to see his grandchildren, you'd like to see, although he did have children, however, nonetheless, you still want to see him growing old at this young age, beautiful age, plus a child who most resembled Rasulullah <laughs> On the day of Ashura, after the companions were all martyred, Imam al Hussein looks around and he starts calling, Hal min Nasr in Yansur? Hal min Mu'in in Yu'inuna? Is there anyone to support us? Is there anyone to help us? He looks towards the tent and he sees a beautiful, handsome young man coming out. And that is his son Ali al Akbar, the first of the family members. He comes to approaches his father. He says, Father, give me the permission to go and defend you. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam cries. He raises his hand and he raises his hand. He says, Allahumma shahad ala ha'ula al Oh Allah, bear witness on these people. A man has come out to them who most resembles your Prophet, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa In his looks, in his manners, even the way he walks. Whenever we missed looking at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, we would look at him and he would remind us of him. Ali al-Akbar then realized this is the permission to go and fight. He rides his horse and he goes to the battle like a lion, calling, Ana Ali ibn al-Husayn ibn Ali, Nahnu wa baytullah awla bin nabi. I am Ali, the son of Hussein, the son of Ali. I am from the Prophet's family. I will fight against you bravely. He fights, indeed, like a lion, like a hero. He reminds the people, the enemies of his grandfather, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam, in the battles. He fights and fights. Then he comes back to his father after some time. He says, Father, I've become very tired. Is there any water to drink? I am thirsty. His father says, son, there is no water around. But wait, it is only a few moments until you see grant your grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and he'll give you a drink that will quench your thirst for eternity. He is about to go back to the battlefield. Imam al Hussein tells him, Ya Ali, Go to the tent, bid farewell to Zainab alayhi salam, to the women, they're waiting for you. He goes back, they look at him, they hug him, they kiss him. And then he goes back to the battlefield, he starts fighting bravely. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam rides on his horse, waiting for the call of his son until the enemies surround him from all sides. One of them hits him with a spear on his chest, another one strikes him with the sword on his head. At that moment, he cries, Abi, Abata, Aleika, Minni, Oh, my father, I bid my salam to you. I am seeing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He gave me a drink of water that has quenched my thirst already. And he says there is another drink prepared for you, Ya Abu Abdullah. And he falls to the plains of Karbala. Imam al-Hussein rushes to him, kills his killer, 
and then throws himself onto the body of Ali Akbar and cries, Waladi Ali, Ala Dunya, Ba'daka Al Afa. My son Ali, I wish I had never lived to see this moment. He then turns to Umar ibn Sa'ad, he says, Ya ibn Sa'ad, may Allah kill your son like you killed my son. And then Ali Akbar died on the chest of Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein turned to Bani Hashim. He said, Bani Hashim, come and raise Ali. Come and help me carry him. Because whenever I carry one part, another part falls of Ali Akbar. They came, they carried him back to the tent. His aunt Zainab came to see him, covered in blood, covered in arrows and spears. She cried, Waladi Ali. Let's read this ayah five times together. Many mu'mineen have requested us to remember them in dua. Some of them are ill. Those mu'mineen who we mentioned their names who are suffering from some illnesses, may Allah grant them a quick recoveries as well. And all mu'mineen and mu'minat who have hajat. Let's read this ayah together five times. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Amma yujibu al-muttar ila al-aq wa yakshifu al-su. Amma yujibu al-muttar ila al-aq wa yakshifu al-su. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء اللهم اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم ارحمنا برحمتك الواسعة اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعة محمد وآل محمد اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين اللهم ارزقنا شفاعة فاطمة الزهراء يا الله في الدنيا وفي القبر وفي الآخرة لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغمة عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات especially for the arwah of the marhumin of Sayyid Nazim and his respected wife and those marhumin who we mentioned their names and for the shifa of those mu'mineen who we mentioned their names earlier, and for the arwah of all our mu'mineen, rahim Allah man yabra'a surat al-mubarakat al-fatiha ma'a salat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. I beg your forgiveness, brothers and sisters, I have to leave immediately because to drive in about, about an hour and a half and we have some majalis to prepare for it tonight so I do beg for your forgiveness but insha'Allah please remember me in your du'as may Allah accept all our hajat insha'Allah sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad